Thank you, Xavier. So, uh, th thank you first for uh, inviting me for the interesting PhD and for giving a talk. It's always a great honor to give a talk in uh, the MTG with our old skilled people in front of uh, uh, the yesterday jury and uh, André. Um, so, uh, I, I will be the opposite as uh, Simon did. So, that means Simon wrote a very long extract and had 90 slides. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I wrote a three lines abstract because I had no idea what I will tell and I have something like 100 slides. So, uh, <laughs> really, so actually, I, I decided to, to give you an overview because, as Xavier tell, uh, uh, I'm at to the point in my career where I have to think about where I'm going. So I, 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 was, I just want to, to give you a flavor. So it's a menu de dégustation of uh, the kind of thing we're doing, what are the problematics we try to face today. So uh, as Xavier told, uh, MIR is, is uh, something like a small team at Aircam. It's not the main activity, but still we, we are around six to eight people continuously to, to work on this problem. And, um, and actually the kind of problem we're facing, we, we try to solve problem, interesting problem or problem from the industry by providing, uh, we try to be innovative in terms of technology. And everything we do at IRCAM uh, in, in my group, in my subgroup, is only based on audio. So that means we don't use text or stuff like that when mining. We always start from audio, extract stuff from audio, chroma, environment, chroma, stuff like that. We have models which are either learned by machine or by a human. So this is the case, for example, uh, the bar pointer model. We don't use that, but we use a dynamic Bayesian network to infer bit or core, stuff like that. And then we estimate concepts which are discrete values uh, or classes, as genre, mood, which are class, or continuous values such as speech, or abstract values which are used in comparison to other values, and this is the case. When we do uh, audio similarity, uh, when you do cover version, this is to have a continuous value, or when we do uh, fingerprint. So this is the generic <laughs> framework that we're working on. And, uh, and I will skip this one. And yeah, and part of this framework is the one when we do audio classification, <coughs> when we classify into genre, mood, instrument, and basically that's all the same. Uh, that's always uh, we extract audio features, we do somehow integration, we select on that features, we do transformation, then we have a classification algorithm either uh, generative models, discriminant models, classification by examples. And uh, at, at the late of the project, uh, we had a big project, which was a Quiro project, a six, six years project that ends in 2003, and we end up with this classification schema. So I don't know if you can read it. It's large enough, okay. So basically, we started from audio, and we had a complex audio descriptor. So that means basically, we start from simple male frequency capsule coefficient, spectral flatness measure, so these are really standard features. And instead of using the usual back of frame, we took inspiration from speech processing using uh, speaker, uh, speaker identification technique, known as the un universal background model, in which you just train a huge uh, GMM, uh, Gaussian mixture model, to represent all the world, all your database, all the data all the musical data that you can get, and uh, after you adapt it to this specific case, and it is named Super Vector. And in this system, we had another um, nice tool, which is also coming from speech, which is the multivariate autoregressive model. So all, you all know what is an autoregressive model in speech. is the, is the basis of the uh, uh, linear prediction coding. So that means T sample is predict as a linear combination of the previous one. But you can do that with a vector. So you have a set of vectors, and you can do that not using the audio waveform, but using audio features. So the MFCC are actually modeled as a multivariate autoregressive model. And you also use the residual, as you use the residual in speech, you can do the same with features. And all that goes to a set of uh, super vector machine uh, with uh, RBA. And this, this was actually the, uh, the uh, machine 
learning schema that you were applied to old problem and that succeed very well. I mean, at that time, we were still participating in Marex and that performed uh, very well. So what we remark in this framework is that uh, the different, uh, I mean, from the audio signal to the, what we use to name audio features, such as MFCC to the mach machine learning, that what we use to learn machine learning, which is the SVM part with late fusion and stuff like that, there is a whole stuff that change everything. It is this modeling, this features modeling, which will be the model adaptation, which is unsupervised training uh, of GMM, which is adapted, so it is a transform, uh, manually created uh, feature <laughs> integration in the autoregressive models. There is a whole stuff, and the distinction between audio features and machine learning becomes very weak. And that's something we agree today with uh, when we use deep learning technologies such as uh, convolutional neural network. There is not anymore any difference between the machine learning part and the audio feature part. They are both managed. So a part of our work has been in studying all these features integration. So this is somehow a representation of the different kind of features integration you can do. So that means what I mean integration is that to avoid the bag of frame where you don't care about the behavior of the features, you will apply um, you will apply transform and we study, you know all the delta, the delta, the median. Uh, we work with Florian Kaiser with a multi-probe histogram, multivariate autoregressive models. In uh, Vienna, they work with the block features. Uh, we work at Erkem with the modulation spectrum, uh, with Hugo Marchand with the modulation scale spectrum. These are all mathematical operators. On the other side, you can have a uh, train transform of the features, such as universal background model, where you take all your features and you train in an unsupervised way. So that means without knowing the labels, you train the big GMM and you adapt it. This is the same case in deep learning when you use restricted Boltzmann machine or autoencoder. It's completely unsupervised. You just train a representation to fit the best the world of your features. And you have NMF and uh, shift invariant PLCA, which are also two variants of unsupervised learning. And in the train supervised way, we, uh, we, work, we start working actually with the convolutional network. But still, in most of this case, you still have this uh, machine learning, uh, being SVM, multi-layer perceptron, which is always the last stage of uh, every uh, deep learning method, it's always fully connected. <laughs> Or the uh, time uh, time description, such as dynamic time warping, SVM with uh, alignment kernel, uh, hidden Markov model, or Bayesian network, as we saw yesterday, conditional random field, or LSTN and stuff like that. So this is a bit the overall framework. So what I will present you today, so this is the end of my long introduction, what I will present you today is what happened between this point and this point at Erkam. So this point actually is the last time I gave a talk at the MTG. So I spent the, the night yesterday to find back the slide. And, 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 because I, were, I was ready to talk to you again about tempo and stuff like that, but no, I really talk about that. So we're still working on tempo and a bit, but I won't talk about that. So I will present that. So this part is not yet uh, finished. So uh, as in many research centers, you can remark that most of the activity is funded either by European project or national project. The project I will talk, uh, I, I won't have the time to talk about all the projects. I will uh, talk to you mainly about the B-Music project because uh, <laughs> nobody knows that we did this project. So you will be the first one to know, to know it. 3TVS project, if I have the time, which was, so B Music project to summarize was our first project at scale. So that means we had to deal not with uh, 10,000 tracks, but with several millions of tracks. So I will talk about uh, how we deal with that uh, technically and what, is, what was then the philosophy to, to help dealing with that. 3DTVS was multimodal, so that means it was a UPRINT project about doing uh, content analysis in uh, 3D TV. So, you know, 3D TV unfortunately completely failed, but uh, in 2012, when the Ukraine 
commission decide to fund the project, there was a big buzz uh, in all the catalog of the supermarket. You, you could buy the 3D TV. So uh, how you can benefit from the 3D information in video and in audio, and in video and audio, that means multimodal, to do a better uh, estimation. And the KVG project, which is another urban project, the goal of it is to drive a synthesizer using your voice to do some sketching so that when you exchange information with your friends, you do a sketch, uh, a drawing sketch in some design. So that means designing sound for companies such as a car, uh, a ship's packet or stuff like that. That's some design or uh, the, the railway or Telefonica. I don't know. You use some design and all you can do that. So I hope I will have the time to deal with all that. So basically, I will try to cover uh, some part of this. Uh, I, I like a lot of flowchart, so you will have many flowchart. So we start in 2003, we have an audio signal, we extract audio features, then we learn model to estimate a concept. So concept are instrument, genre, mood, chord, key, structure, beat, whatever. Um, uh, and the learned models that can be done by machine learning, super vector machine, or uh, done by M using Bayesian network. Uh, that means using language model, you know that a chord is followed by another chord, a non-beat is followed by a beat, and stuff like that. So the first thing we did in B music is that we had to deal with uh, this, uh, this huge amount of data. So oh, the first question is, how do you do that in uh, somehow what we name big data in, uh, in music, which is not really big data because we only have millions of titles. And, and, but still, we have, uh, we, we have uh, billions of audio features. So how do we deal with that? Then uh, a thing that we, uh, we work a lot on currently is uh, in what we name feature invariance. Feature invariance is how to design audio features that will be invariant to a specific variation. So that means when we do MFCC, so MFCC, uh, for those of you who are specialized in the signal processing, MFCC comes from the capsule decomposition that is supposed to separate the sources from uh, the spectral envelope from the filter. And then that's the reason for having MFCC invariance to pitch. So this is an example of an audio features, but how can you do that in another way? So I will uh, talk briefly about that. I don't think I will have the time to talk about language models. So that's the work we did with Dynamic Bayesian Network for the joint estimation of uh, beat, uh, chord, and key, and musical structure. Then uh, I think, uh, yeah, another work. You, you can find the audio features uh, manually, you can create the invariants manually, but you can also do, uh, you can also run an algorithm to generate automatically other features. And I will present you some experiment with it, with shift invariant PLCA, and maybe I will talk a bit about uh, multimodality. So if there are specific field topics in this that you are interested, or specific fields that you are absolutely not interested, I will be happy to skip or emphasize some of them. So is there some specific part that you would like me to deal with? That's the interactive part, as, as we would say, Simon. Yeah. So who vote for this? <laughs> Let's be democratic. Uh, invariant features. OK. Who vote for this? Okay, <laughs> I will get into trouble. Who no. vote for this? I, I can, I can do that quickly. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so I will do all very quickly. <laughs> okay, first problem. So I, I, I will uh, first talk about this part. So in B music, the main problem is represented here. So this is the number of titles that uh, we have to deal with. So it's several million titles, and this is the number of titles we have to deal with uh, in various projects, echoed quite old. It means something like uh, 40,000 tracks, and this is uh, 6 million tracks. So it, just to give you <laughs> what means to go for. Uh, so basically, that means that uh, when you deal with 6 million tracks, so that means you have this number of features if you deal with this upside. So basically, you 
those of you who work with that knows the problem. You cannot store the data in a single computer. It has to be stored in a cluster. Uh, and he, then it poses problem, uh, problem of computation. So what are the two main problems here we're dealing with is how to do machine learning on six million strikes. So you've got, for example, music genre associated. So this was a project, B Music, was done for uh, the SNET, which is, uh, uh, I guess you, you have the same in Spain, is the uh, National Syndicate of uh, Phonographic uh, Edition. So that means that the official company that deals with the, the official instance of the government that uh, somehow govern the distribution of, uh, of music in the country. So all you, all you do training on six million titles. Another thing, all you do uh, fingerprint uh, on, on this amount of, the, uh, of data, which is, I mean, in the case of BMAT or, uh, <laughs> or Shazam, not a problem, but in our case, uh, it was uh, a problem. So data are split into uh, many hard drives, so that means you have uh, several terahertz data. <coughs> Computation is distributed uh, over the cluster, so that means you have the basic problem. The computation must be close to the data, so that means uh, you have a, actually, it's simpler to illustrate with, with this. So uh, this is a machine where you've got a set of CPU, you've got memory, and you have hard drive. And when you do this kind of problem, each computation must be close to the data in order to avoid transfer over the network. So basically, what we did in this is, is not new for people who specialize in that, but we are a research center, so we're not specialized in that. So I will share with you my experience. So we can distinguish several types of problems. So the first is uh, the simple parallelization case. So that means you have a music track, you want to extract call, uh, key, tempo, meta structure. So this is really easy. You just have a set of software. Uh, that runs on parallel over a distributed cluster. You just have to manage where the files are, why you have to launch the computation. Then you have all these kinds of machine learning problems. So that means data are distributed over a lot of hard drive, or do you train the machine learning? So that means the system, that means to access the data, all the data for training the system. And the third problem, which is on the application side, how do you deal with search of a, a large amount of data? So that means when you do a fingerprint, how do you deal with uh, the, uh, the, uh, a fast search of this amount of data? So as, as I told, the first problem is ki uh, kind of easy. So that means you have a master node. So that means a master computer that knows where are the data and ask the algorithm to run on each computer close to the data. Um, the other problem is more annoying. So this is, uh, for example, in SNAP, we have 4 million titles. So another interesting thing, it was, a, it was a real case scenario. So that means we had to learn the genre which are officially, because the SNAP officially provide the label that will be used in the recording store. So to give you an idea, this is uh, somehow the representativity of a subset of the data. So for the SNAP, we see that we have the large majority of the track are classical music. Then we have uh, uh, international pop, uh, we have rock, I don't know where is jazz. Jazz is also highly represented. But then you also need to train models such as text, variété, I guess you have the same, uh, pop international, uh, World music, Xavier Roland, I love this term. So, you know, this, this is all this kind of exotic Indian Turkish music that it's all the same, it's world music. I mean, like flamenco, it's the same. So, that's the vision that, uh, that the company has. And all that, uh, you need to train the machine learning uh, system to, to learn this, and that means that basically, the machine learning system is much more complex. So that means the data are distributed over hard drive, and you need to perform a computation of a TIS. So for example, how do you train a GMM, a Gaussian mixture model? For those who know machine learning, it's an iterative process. You need to compute covariance metrics over the whole set of data, and the data are distributed. So actually, we had to discover this whole world of data and uh, what is usually named MapReduce algorithm. So that means how to subdivide uh, a simple uh, algorithm such as GMM or more complex like SVM 
as the collection of a subset of operations. For example, a GMM will be trained by computing a part of the mean uh, vector here, the covariance matrix here, another part here, so you have something like 100 computers, then the master node will collect the information of everybody, and then you do the expectation maximization in, uh, in this way by going, uh, going uh, in both directions. So this was kind of very uh, time-consuming task. Uh, today, uh, today actu actually, uh, solutions are much more, uh, much more simple. So actually, the pro uh, in my opinion, the problem with big data for research is that we reach a point where the difference between what you can do with research and what completely depends on the fast-evolving technology be becomes critical. In 2003, Spark was not existing. Uh, for those who know the domain, Spark is, uh, is a um, scalable uh, environment, uh, distributed environment developed by Apache with a machine learning library uh, called MLLib. In 2003, there was only uh, Adobe, uh, uh, Hadoop from Apache uh, with uh, Maud for the machine learning, which was very bad with very few. Uh, so that means that to deal with this problem in 2003, we have to develop a whole set of MapReduce algorithm and cluster management. Last problem is uh, we have to deal with uh, audio fingerprint at scale. So this is, uh, this is another problem. So that means in runtime, when for the application you distribute, you need to have access to all the data. And uh, the use case we were developing in this uh, project was finding uh, doubloon. How do you say that in English? One track are similar. No, duplicates. duplicates, yeah, duplicates. So actually, what we discover is that when you have, for example, and I discuss with people from uh, Deezer in Paris, and they agree with that, when you when a company say that it has six, 60 million titles, that's a fake, actually, because uh, the number of unique titles is something like six to eight million. So maybe YouTube or Last FM will be different, but most of uh, uh, the, uh, the huge Deezer and Spotify catalog actually can be reduced by duplicates. So the problem is that when you have a real music catalog, many tracks are the same, or nearly the same. What I uh, call nearly the same is that means that's the same track that has been slightly remastered, changing the volume, slightly the equalization curve, and adding one, one second of silence at the beginning. So that means, basically, there is no way you can find duplicates just uh, computing MD5 code over the file. So that means the content is different. No, the, the form is different, but the content is similar according to us. I mean, nobody can make the difference between the track. And of course, the metadata that the company receives, such as Deezer or Spotify, uh, I mean, what is interesting is that the, 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 the big music company doesn't make any effort to, clean, to distribute clean data. And uh, what we had to develop for, for this system is a, is a deduplicate system, so finding the duplicates, in order to be able to propagate the right information to the right track. And this is an example. So this is, a track, uh, this is uh, the track identifier for uh, Warner. Uh, this is the track identifier, and these are all the similar tracks uh, uh, among the six million titles. So all these tracks are have the same content as this one. And this has been obtained using audio fingerprint. I, I will not talk uh, uh, really about audio fingerprint because you all know that. But what is interesting is that thanks to that, we were able to assign the same unique identifier, which is named uh, ISRC, International Standard Recording Code, to the track, and also propagate the right information, because the right information is Edith Piaf, La Vie en Rose, which is a famous title, but it was somehow uh, related as uh, Chanson pour Maman, uh, Une autre track, uh, track number 20, uh, track number 8, and that's the metadata that provides uh, a company. So to do that, we needed, because for this, we need to develop a system that will compare 6 million titles with 6 million titles. So it's highly uh, intensive on computation time. And the difference with Shazam, uh, with the Shazam system, is that here we need to fingerprint the whole track duration to be sure that the whole track content is similar to the, another one. 
And what we did with that, uh, what we did, so there are several techniques to do that we can, uh, in the past, we use uh, M3, which is a kind of, of uh, uh, search algorithm for uh, in large uh, dimensional data or hashing techniques. And in this case, actually, what we develop is a system that will create a hash. So that means a unique identifier based on the fingerprint. So that means we extract an audio fingerprint, we hash it. So we create a string that will represent this frame of, of time, okay? So each frame of the file becomes a string, and, and then a music track becomes a web page full of words. And then what we use for that, we use text search engine. So that means we rely on uh, Apache Lucent, for those of you who know. So that's a normal text search engine. I guess that those of you doing NLP uh, knows it. And uh, we use the search engine uh, Solar, which is open source. And each frame uh, of a track becomes a word, and a track becomes a web page. And we trying to do uh, uh, text retrieval in web page, which provides us our fingerprint. So for that, we need one thing. We need a system that is able to provide uh, uh, hash. So everybody is familiar with the concept of hash? So that means that an algorithm that provides a unique string for uh, uh, a given input. So for that, we need, uh, in order to do fingerprint and allow mastering or uh, noise addition, stuff like that, we need a system that is able to, com to convert an audio frame, whatever it is a bit longer, a bit shorter, pitch it with noise, with uh, equalization curve, it has to provide the same hash value. So that means we put all our effort in finding a hash representation of our code, which is invariant to noise, to uh, audio degradation, to time stretching, and stuff like that. So, for example, the algorithm of Shazam, when you extract the peak in the time and frequency plane, is invariant to added noise, okay? Because you have a set of hash. So, what we develop here, that uh, since you you are filming in, I just mask this box because it's not yet published. We develop a system that somehow, uh, so it's a new approach that allows to use data augmentation to find audio features. So that means we formulate the whole problem as a set of class. So that means our problem is to obtain the same hash value for a track independently of its audio transformation. So we took 300,000 audio track, we create for each track 300 transformation. And these 300,000 uh, track are 300 classes in the, in the sense of machine learning. So we have 300,000 classes, and for each of them, we have 300 observation, which are the audio degradation. And then what we did is we apply supervised machine learning, because then it becomes a supervised problem, to find the right set of uh, signal processing and machine learning combination that will create a feature, so not your features, which becomes invariant to the uh, to transformation. So I repeat, we have a track and we want this 300 transformation to provide the same value and we want that for all the tracks. So we transform that in a supervised machine learning and at the end we have a representation, uh, and a, re a representation such that its hash value becomes invariant to transformation. So the, this, uh, this is a, a work that will be published soon. It's, it's really interesting. If you have questions, do not hesitate to interrupt me. So now I come to another part. So uh, in this part, uh, I just show the big data and I explain how we can, no, actually I briefly explain how we can obtain uh, invariant features in a sup uh, using supervised learning. So that means we could have there are other possibilities. We, for, for example, when you use convolutional neural network, you somehow obtain a, a representation that will be in, you try to find a representation at the end which is invariant to, uh, uh, to a class. So in this work, so that's a work that we, uh, we started a long time ago, so that's uh, Xavier Rodet who started this work with uh, the, the modulation spectrum. The idea is that uh, as 
uh, as Simon insists on, uh, music is not only uh, a, a bag of frames, so there is a specific ordering of the frame. And Xavier uh, Rodel proposed a, a long time ago what is, uh, what is being named by, uh, uh, by Lee and Atlas the modulation spectrum, which consists in, um, so this is the usual Fourier transform equation, you take the absolute value and you study the evolution of each Fourier transform shadows over time. You can do that with gamaton filters. You do a transform of, uh, you compute in the frequency domain the temporal evolution of the content inside each frequency band. Another way of viewing that, for example, when Shirer does bit tracking with his uh, critical bands, actually he computes the correlation inside each frequency band. So this is a system that we use for many tasks and that we, uh, we develop features that, in, that has been then applied to model the temporal behavior of audio features. We proposed that, Makine proposed that uh, too in, uh, in 2003, and Brian Whitman named that pin feature. These are all the same. It's modeling the evolution of audio features or the signal of a specific frequency band by Fourier transform. So that was the starting point, and, um, and then there was this parallel work uh, of André. André found back this nice transform by, uh, by Cohen, which is the scale transform. So it's a mathematical transform as the Fourier transform, but as you see, there is a difference here in the, the exponent of the, instead of having a, a E minus G omega T, like the Fourier transform, there is a log. And this log actually will make this transform invariant to the scale. So the Fourier transform is, uh, uh, represents the signal decomposed over frequency. Here, the signal is decomposed over scale. So that means if you have the same signal uh, spread and uh, you have a, a dilatation or a compression, you will obtain the same value. So that's what André uh, proposed. To, uh, to represent the content of an audio signal that was in 2009 or Somewhere in the dark ages. <laughs> the dark ages. And mathematically, this is expressed by if you have a signal, a scale transform. If you take, uh, if you multiply, so that means uh, stretch the signal, you obtain the same modulus of the scale transform, but a uh, 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 a phase variation, and to get rid of this phase variation, what you use is to apply it to the autocorrelation, which, is, which becomes then uh, invariant to the position. So what we did with uh, Hugo Marchand, so Hugo Marchand will present his PhD uh, in two weeks, uh, so <laughs> it is the English translation that will help you. Um, the idea is to include the, uh, the scale transform, so that means a transform which is invariant to the position, within the modulation spectrum, so that means having a decomposition in the various frequency band, so that we can have a representation which is specific to every frequency band. So in the case of a rhythm, or, uh, we could distinguish the I will try to, to adapt to the music. We could distinguish the sound produced by the Brian from the one from the Diane. Uh, in the case of a, of a drum, we could distinguish the kick from the stair, from the i head. So we have all the various frequency then. And this is then the modulation scale uh, spectrum, which is roughly uh, the same work as uh, André did, but applied to the various frequency bands. So that means we have a, a, a signal that we will split in frequency band with unset function, compute the correlation, and giving a scale transform. And this improves a lot, actually. So uh, here, are, uh, this, here, this is a set of experiments on the Ballroom uh, dataset, the 700 track version, where you have comparison to the results. And with this representation of uh, the various frequency band, which completely makes sense, you of course have a result than if you consider a single frequency band. So you would. So these are the results on the, the balloon <laughs> test set. And the goal to use a scale invariant representation is to have a representation of the rhythm content, so that means the interaction of the various elements, which is independent of the tempo. So that means if you change the tempo, it's still the same rhythm pattern. How to show that? 
So Jensen proposed a, a nice method that actually will use a, a KNN, K nearest neighbors, as a classifier. And when you search over the KNN space, you remove all the points which have the same tempo. And this is a new experimental protocol. And when you apply that, Jensen method dropped to 48 and uh, all that fell to 66 and the modulation to 75. So still, we've got here a clear proof that we've got a tempo invariant representation. So then, there was still this problem when we, uh, when we do all this, uh, this transform, is that in real music, when we do boom, ta, boom, ta, we're not doing boom, ta, boom, ta, okay? There is a, an interrelationship between the various frequency bands. They are not independent. There is a specific order. When we use the modulation spectrum or modulation scale uh, transform, actually, we model each frequency band in their own world. So this is the same uh, in Eric Scheirer tempo detection. Each frequency band are modeled individually. And then we cannot distinguish boom ta, boom ta from boom ta, boom ta, or uh, uh, Gena, Gena. <laughs> I try to adapt to the music. <laughs> okay. okay, so what we want to do is to find a representation that allows to represent this interrelationship between the various frequency bands. So the idea is, of course, is to move from 1D, so instead of having each band separately, we will move to 2D. So that means we will create a transform based on the 2D scale transform applied to the two, uh, and applied to a 2D Fourier transform in order to have a joint time and frequency representation. Nice. Nice idea, theoretically perfect. But there is a problem here, is that when we compute the uh, Fourier, uh, when we compute, where is it? This is the Fourier transform. When we compute it, the 2D Fourier transform is invariant to position, which is nice. So that means we are able to do tum ta, tum ta, tum ta, or ta, tum ta, tum ta, tum. It is the same pattern delayed. So that means it's shift invariant. Circular permutation, nice. So that means, okay, in time we are happy, but in frequency that means the same. So that means there is no more difference between tum, 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 or tum, 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 tum. No, that's the same. <laughs> Let's be fine with example. So you get it. So that means we've got a circular permutation of the, the frequency axis too. So that means low can, frequency can be high, it's just, uh, it's just a circular permutation. So then we arrive with this, uh, with this nice approach, which actually uh, it's a kind of combination between advanced signal processing and uh, recent results uh, in, uh, in perception and neuroscience. Is to include in the modulation scale spectrum auditory statistics. Because you always have several trends uh, working at the same time. So you have the signal processing that does modulation spectrum. Then uh, Stefan Mala show the connection between the scattering transform, which is the modulation spectrum with wavelength and uh, audition. And then you have the work of Josh McDermott and uh, Simon Nelly, which show in a completely different framework that in order to represent some texture, so or urban sound, uh, you need, so it does that by resynthesizing the signal, you need to take into account the cross correlation between the various decomposition. So that means if you have your fre uh, uh, frequency decomposition in gamma tone, you need to represent this interaction. So that's what uh, we did. We then introduced this statistic, and then we have this really nice result which I think are the state of the art uh, on the ballroom data set today, is, uh, so here we've got the result again obtained with the modulation spectrum, with the 2D version of the modulation spectrum. As we see, this does not improve because the circular permutation. But when we add the auditory statistics, so that means reproduce what the here does, so that means compute the correlation between the various uh, inner cell, we have uh, a large increase. And this is with the ballroom, this is with the extended ballroom, this is the 4,000 flight that we did, and this is with the Creton music of, uh, of André, we go now to 77%. Uh, nice, we are happy. 
but it took a lot of work. This was an example of manually or handcrafted uh, audio features purely based on our knowledge of signal processing. The previous work of André extended, it's, it's really nice. So uh, what I want to show here is that these features are, uh, if we go back to the point where we manually, uh, the, the debate where we manually handcraft or automatically learn the features. These are good results, but uh, still take a lot of time. Okay, so now I will move to uh, another research, uh, another research which leads to the use of shift invariant probabilistic latent component analysis. Uh, I will first explain the, co the context, which is the SCAT VG project, so that you will have the time to, ah, no, I suddenly understand what he's talking about, and <laughs> because I'm fed up with all this equation, and then uh, after we will end with that. So the idea in using shift invariant probabilistic uh, latent component analysis, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, I'm sure you're all familiar with non-negative matrix factorization, NMF. So uh, PLCA uh, is the generative, the probabilistic equivalent, and the shift invariant makes stuff able to move in the temporal and frequency uh, direction. So that's a work that has been done uh, in the SCAT VG project. So this, this is a really nice project. It's funded by H, uh, H2020 from the European Commission, and it is a FET project. So a FET project is a future emerging technology. So that's basically uh, the kind of project where you have to take risk and maybe you can fail, but you will be judged on the amount of risk that you took uh, rather than on the quality of the risk. So it's really great to be innovative. So the, the whole framework of this project is to develop, uh, so it's a project which is done uh, with uh, Vene uh, Venice, Venezia, the, uh, the team of Davide Roqueso, with uh, KTH uh, lab and with uh, Genesis, which is a company doing uh, some design. So this is a real prototype, uh, which, is, uh, which is in the end of Stefano from uh, Davide Roqueso team, which is a microphone. And in this microphone, actually, you just uh, speak or... Pro no, you don't speak, actually. You produce sound, and the computer understands the kind of thing you are doing, launch a physical model synthesizer, and then you can uh, somehow drive the synthesizer uh, uh, with your voice, and you have two microphones on top of this. So the idea you don't have any mouse or other, uh, other controller than the microphone. And also there is an uh, um, accelerometer in, in this, so that means you can move the microphone. And then there is uh, at IRCAM also the team of Frédéric Bévillacqua uh, in the gesture analysis that use machine learning to recognize the kind of gesture that, that is produced. So that's the goal. Uh, our problem uh, in, uh, in my group is to recognize automatically the kind of some categories that are produced by human. So for that, there is the perception in some design team of IRCAM that actually they are specialists in creating ontologies, stuff like that. So I don't know if we can name ontology, but how to subdivide the, the, the world of the uh, uh, abstract sound, non-musical, non Big sound into family. So you can distinguish sound which are abstract, such as produced by synthesizer, mechanical interactions, uh, sound that are produced by this. Okay, so you have an interaction, or sound which are produced by machine. So they recorded a large set of data, which will be uh, soon uh, available uh, uh, under the Creative Commons license, I guess, something like that, yeah. Uh, and we, they recorded something like 50 different people imitated, imitating sounds with a three trial. So there is a, that's, that's a huge database. It both recorded in audio, capture uh, in, um, in image with the, uh, the sensor on, on the end. And the goal is how we can recognize uh, the category based on voice and gesture. And to give you an idea of what we're talking about, I can make you listen to, uh, to this. 
I'm afraid to pull up on the network. But. Okay, so this is one of these sounds. So there is a category, dripping. People listen to this sound. Okay. And the idea is that people will imitate this category. We will launch a synthesizer, a physical model that will reproduce dripping sound and then control it by voice. And for that, to the first question is how do people imitate this kind of sound? Because what will be your task is not to recognize the dripping sound, which will be a kind of urban sound or sound effect classification, but to recognize the vocal imitation of the sound. <coughs> this, is a, this is one imitation. Uh, this is feeling, the action of feeling. So I remember that the sound category are targeted to sound design, or you can put sound to an image. So this is the imitation. Okay. This is crumpling. This is the imitation. Okay. This is eating. Eating a bell or something like that. So this is the vocal imitation. This is this is feeling again. So it's the same sound. This is another imitation. Okay, so it's interesting to compare this with this. So we understand that there is not at all the same strategy which is used to reproduce uh, the song. This is rolling. Okay. Okay. So our target, mater our target material are this, this imitation of the song. And our goal is to find back the original category and then launch the synthesizer in order to, to reproduce the song. So the difficulty is, of course, that, as you see, the kind of sounds which are produced here are very far from the kind of sound we use to hear from someone speaking, singing. It's something really different, actually. As we see also, uh, many information are in the way time evolves. It's not the specific sound, because this one uses unvoiced sound, this one uses a uh, siffle uh, blowing, no, whistling. Whistling, it's a pitched sound, high frequency, uh, noised sound with uh, some formant, but there is a trajectory. Are these uh, reproduction attempts consistent between different people? Okay, so then, the first thing we try, <laughs> exactly, and since I don't want to, 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 to bore you, I will skip a part. The first thing we try, actually, is the whole set of time series classification. So that means we I'll come back to my presentation. No, this is what I was supposed to talk about. Okay. So the first thing we try, we try the whole set of machine, uh, temporal machine learning stuff. So that means we try to model the vocal characteristic. So that means I, uh, we have uh, how many? We have 50 categories, and for each of the 50 categories, we've got 50 imitation, which use different attributes to imitate the sound, but they all add in their brain the same idea of imitating this sound. We've got the audio from that, we've got the gesture from that. So Frédéric Bevilacqua team work on uh, uh, analysis of time sequence of gesture and see if there was any relation between the time gesture and the category imitated. And actually, no. <laughs> there, there is no. So that means people use completely different strategy to do that. Uh, so that means some will imitate an increasing sound, will do something like that. Uh, 
Some uh, will do, uh, oh, uh, some even will do that. Some will not move at all. Uh, the only interesting thing is that people tend to do that when there is noise. So when there, there is noise. But that, that's the only thing. So in the audio, we try the whole set of, uh, of usual uh, temporal sequence uh, recognition. So that includes hidden Markov model using continuous or discrete variable. Morphological uh, description, so that means we will create specific descriptors that represent increasing shape, decreasing shape, or dynamic time warping, so that means doing pairwise, uh, pairwise alignment between each sequence, and then uh, inferring weighting. So this is an example of time series alignment, so that means we have two signal and we have a set of audio features and then we try to find uh, which uh, went through. But since there was no uh, <coughs> common strategy to, uh, to describe the sound, and since people were using sounds that were completely uh, different from what is used in speech or singing voice, our question then became, what are the strategies used by people? What are the mechanisms <coughs> used by people to reproduce sounds? What kind of sounds are they doing in majority to imitate this category? Are they doing more uh, succession of voiced sound in voiced sound, with formant, no formant, with uh, um, uh, plosive sound and stuff like that? And what we did, and then comes uh, the machine learning part, because we had to be innovative, so we propose actually to use shift invariant PLCA to find what were the prototype of sounds that people were using. So shift invariant PLCA is a technique I can show you the terrific equation after. It's a probabilistic model that will maximize the probability of observing specific kernels translated at specific positions. Usually, it's a technique which is used, for example, by uh, Smaragdis or Dot or by uh, Juan. It's basically a technique that has been developed in the context of source separation. So that means you have a signal and you want to separate it, or you want to do a multi-pitch transcription. For example, the team of uh, Simon Emmanuel Benetos is one of the king of uh, uh, transcription using uh, shift in bar and PLCA. Here, the objective is completely different. So that means we will not use shift invariant PLCA to obtain a transcription, but to find a prototype. And what we will do is that we will apply the EM algorithm of the shift invariant PLCA not to a single track, but to the whole collection of track. So that means we will concatenate the whole corpus of sound, the whole set of vocal imitation, train the shift invariant PLCA on this to obtain the set of prototype kernels that are used. So what do you use? Shift invariant, of course, we want to be able to shift over time, highlight the kernel at a specific position, but also we will work in the constant Q domain. We want to be able that this specific sound produced is a combination of a voiced sound in low frequency and an unpitched signal, a noise signal in high frequency. And after what we use, we will take, and then we have the usual uh, machine learning framework, we will use a, a vocal signal, uh, perform a deconvolution of it to obtain the activation, so that means more precisely the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the high value of the uh, impulse probability over time, and learn a hidden Markov model based on this, uh, on this uh, activation of the time to then recognize if the user was imitated, uh, imitating a mixer of, uh, or fridge or uh, to tell you the kind of uh, really uh, difficult. Uh, so maybe I will skip that. Those who, who knows, <laughs> you will understand. So basically, shift invariant probabilistic latent semantic analysis with PXY, which is uh, um, frequency and time, and you try to maximize the, uh, the representation of this probability using a set of kernels, which are time and frequency kernels, that's piece of uh, the constant Q, position at various places over the spectrum. These are the uh, convolution, or if you want, the shifting of the time and frequency 
of the of the kernel response. So it was highly ambitious, and the good thing actually is that it works. So this is <laughs> it works. So this is, for example, the comparison of a real vocal imitation to its uh, resynthesis using a shift invariant PLCA. So we are very far from a, a usual sound. These are uh, the uh, example of reconstructing each time. So this is one kernel, this is the second one. So this is the reconstruction of uh, this vocal limitation uh, using only one kernel, which is then translated over frequency. And these are the final set of kernels that we found that people were using. So that means with these six kernels, you can represent uh, the uh, five, uh, 5,000 vocal limitation. So this is, uh, it's expressed in constant Q, so this is mo mostly uh, a pitched signal. This is uh, a single one with noise in high frequency. Here we've got two different components. This is, uh, this one is difficult to interpret because it will be shifted. And this is mainly a, a noise signal. So this is, if you want, the basis that allows you when you shift T6 basis to, re to recompose the audio signal. And then uh, we'll skip the, the, yeah. In terms of classification, so that means uh, the goal is that now we have somehow the possibility to represent, what's the goal of doing that? It's not to have the best result, is to be able to understand, to have a semantic interpretation of how what succession of kernel people are using over time to imitate a given category. The consequence of that is that we will have recognition results, which are expressed here. So that means uh, for blowing, we, are, uh, we have a, a recognition of 41% uh, uh, for uh, vehicle uh, exterior uh, 11, so it works very badly for that. For rubbing, so that means it, it works very well. So this is the HMM uh, hidden Markov model recognition of the activation of shifting variant uh, over time. And this is again the example. Uh, so this, this example, for example, uh, this example has been regenerated by translating the kernel number nine, uh, kernel number eight at the beginning. So I don't know what this because I have only six kernels here. So I've got a problem. It's not here. Kernel number 10, kernel number 7, 8, and then we have a kind of uh, transcription over time of the vocal imitation. So this is a sort of representation as we will have in, in speech translation. That means a succession of vowels of typhoon over time. But instead, here we obtain the kernel in a complete and supervised way. So I present you that. Because with this, we obtain a system, we develop a prototype system. Of course, as we saw, for recognition, it's less efficient than dynamic time warping alignment. But we develop a system which allow to find automatically features, which are, in this case, uh, the kernel of the uh, PLCA, automatically in an unsupervised way, just in generating automatically uh, the signal. Uh, maybe uh, I will stop here because I'm already late, so other kind of research we're doing, uh, we're still working in a, in a dynamic Bayesian network, too, but that's more on estimating higher level concepts, such as a concept for which there is a natural language, such as called succession bit, and I will also skip this part about uh, uh, multimodal uh, indexing, just to sum up, uh, we somehow show that uh, if you're using uh, several audio channels such as 5.1 in a DVD, you, uh, you can improve much better tasks such as uh, speech, music, segmentation in movie. So just, uh, I just show one slide of this and I end on, ah, I haven't talked about convolutional network. Um, so we work with real movies. That was a project with Arte TV, if you know it, the French uh, and Belgian TV. Uh, and we work on real movies, so that were real movies that we manually uh, annotated. And for each movie, the tasks are 
uh, we want actually to obtain a precise description of the movie, which includes tasks such as segmentation into speech and music. For each music segment, recognize its genre or its mood, as we do in Maya, except that this is uh, music uh, in movie, so usually uh, the, in, in the kind of work we will do, genre will be, uh, will be soundtrack. <laughs> so that's, that will not help a lot. And genre and mood are really important because it can help the interpretation of the scene. Another thing we, we did is uh, speaker, uh, speaker and face recognition. So that means in audio, uh, you know the task of speaker recognition. We recognize when a speaker is speaking in a debate or on the radio. Uh, in image, they have a face recognition, so that means they can recognize more or less the face in the movie. And we work on the combination of both to do actor identification. So we, can, we know we have a system that can say when Brad Pitt is appearing in the movie. And it is a difficult problem, as the one of Simon, but in another way, because when you have an actor, he's not necessarily speaking at the same time that he's on the, on, on the screen. So we have a kind of overlap, a fuzzy overlap between when he's appearing and when he's speaking. Uh, that's it. And really, if you want, I can just tell you what we do with deep learning. Are you interested? Or? It's very simple. We just have the beginning of deep learning. So. Um, Mainly what we do is, our interest in doing deep learning is uh, because everybody, everybody, everybody does it. So that's our interest. No, that's not. <laughs> now, our interest is again, um, is in the power of finding new features. Okay, new audio features. Uh, the ability of a, a neural network, and especially we're working with a convolutional neural network, to find a representation uh, in a supervised way, because convolutional network are a su uh, supervised training, that allows to indicate us which time of the time frequency plane are important for this category. So we're mostly doing um, <laughs> not deep at all neural networks, and that means we try to restrict the number of layers to few in order to keep a semantic of this. And we we work on that. Uh, we work on that uh, last year in the context of uh, structure estimation. So structure estimation, you all know what it is. You have a track, you have part, and you want to uh, cut uh, the signal into the various parts. So we did a lot of work on that in, uh, with handcrafted method. What changes this domain is that there is no uh, big data set, which has the Salami data set that allows to do supervised training. Brian McPhee proposed a supervised method to do that, and you all know Jan Schluter and uh, Thomas Grill that proposed this, uh, this kind of uh, machine to solve any problem, which is based on uh, an, uh, applying a convolutional neural network to a log mail spectrum. So we have a log mail spectrum. You have a set of layers of uh, convolution. So for those of you who are familiar with convolutional network, this is really easy. For those of you who are not, uh, like I was here one year ago, uh, each convolution is like learning automatically a two filters that you will apply. And you have the same property as you have uh, with the uh, uh, shift invariant PLCA, is that actually this filter can move everywhere in the time and frequency plane, except that this is nonlinear and this is uh, supervised. Then after you compute some max pooling to have invariance in time and frequency, then you have a set of layers, and then you, you mastering the backpropagation algorithm and stuff like that. So what we propose in T, so uh, uh, we were, uh, like everybody, amazed by uh, Jens Schluter results, but we were also amazed uh, by each time at Izmir when he showed the various, uh, the various, uh, the various kernels that it, so you learn kernels, you, you learn basic filters. And usually, when you do machine learning, you look at the results, and then if, if it works well, you try to look at the kernels to know if they make sense. And the problem is that most of the time, you cannot understand what's happening because the kernel 
are much too complex to, to understand. So what we studied is how we can move from this to a more semantic representation. And what we propose is to apply the convolutional network not to the male spectrum, but to a higher level representation, which is the self-similarity matrix. So basically, what we propose is to apply uh, to use as a representation, as the image, because uh, convolutional network works with image, to apply that to the set of image along the main diagonal, in which you can already see a specific shape uh, corresponding to, to the various parts. So this is the first proposal that we did, which is just changing the input front end, so it's again features. This is a, a much more interesting modification. What we propose is uh, when you deal with content observation, you always choose a point of view. You choose a point of view on time, on harmony, on rhythm, on blah, blah, blah. And the problem is always how you merge these various representations. Then you always have the problem, uh, will I do late fusion? So that means I have all my system and at the end I combine them and I have a late fusion classification system. This is what uh, Jens Schlutter and Thomas Grill propose, because at the end they do a fusion of the various network. How we can do that with early fusion? And what we propose, this is really for a uh, uh, geek of uh, deep learning, is that we will use the depth of the input layers. So if you know convolutional network, they have been developed for image analysis, and image, a color image, are decomposed into a red, a green, and a blue image. And what we propose is to use the depth of these input layers to represent the various point of view. So that means the input of the network will be a self-similarity matrix representing the time similarity matrix over time, the harmony similarity over time, and the rhythm similarity over time, and the whole set of kernels, so these are tensor actually, these are, these are not 2D kernels, actually these are tensor, will represent from the starting point the, uh, the relation between the various kernels. So far, the results are not, are not as good as uh, the, uh, the one obtained uh, by, uh, by Grill, but we don't have his test set. Which I think we only have half his test set, so it's difficult to really compare. But I mean, this is the result without this uh, fusion uh, at the beginning with MFCC, with Chroma, and this is with this early fusion using the depth. But what is really interesting, and I come back to the, the, the basic point, is that we can understand the filters. So these are the filters which we obtain using uh, the self-similarity similarity matrix as input. As, as you see, you clearly see this kind of diagonals that will represent the uh, difference between the various block. Here you've got uh, we call that a state change over time. So we've got a very uh, semantically interpretable uh, representation uh, of the uh, audio signal. And that's it. We're still pursuing works on this. <laughs> so I think it's just the beginning of this. So our work is really how to, uh, to keep deep learning or shallow learning uh, close to interpretation in order to be able to introduce information. So I stop here, I promise. Yes. Did you use some prior knowledge to include in the transition matrix? No, no. And where is the transition matrix in this case? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's an 8 by 8 transition matrix because we have 8 bases. I haven't looked at that. I haven't looked. Maybe are you considering that this could be some information that is not uh, like could be additionally learned? From the data, or you can put some knowledge. Like, what is the benefit of HMM in the, this case? To, to, to model transition over time. That's, uh, that, that's our goal. Or we model that, so that means we will have one hidden Markov model for each of the category. Okay? So that's a separate hidden Markov model. And each hidden Markov model has a specific transition matrix and a specific uh, observation probability that will represent all likely 
for this category, you will transit from this PLCA basis from this other PLCA basis. We could not do it in a supervised way because that will imply that we have a manual annotation of the 4,000. Uh,